Welcome to my presentation, Luto STR, the making of an ultra-low-cost, high-performance Linux-based software-defined radio. My name is Michael Henrich. I'm software engineering manager at Analog Devices in Munich, Germany. Let me introduce a little bit the story behind the Adam Pluto, which is an active learning module. It is part of the educational program at Analog Devices, and it's meant to introduce the fundamentals of software-defined radio, RF radio frequency, wireless communication, embedded Linux, FPGA, HDL development, open source software and open source hardware to basically everyone. It's designed for users at all levels and all backgrounds. And one of the most important things, it needed to be low cost so that it is student affordable. To the right, you see that software-defined radio requires multiple skill sets from RF design to digital hardware to signal processing and software development. The Pluto SDR is meant to be a platform to practice and to develop those skills. So what were the early on requirements for this device? In order to be student affordable, it needed to be a low cost, uh, also a zero cost ecosystem. So that means that there's no cost involved in order to build or use this uh, device. It needed to be open. When I say open, I mean open hardware, schematics, Gerbers, open firmware, basically all the HDL, the bootloader, Linux, uh, the user space, uh, open host so that it is kind of cross-platform with open drivers and open libraries and of course also open applications for example GNU, Radio, MATLAB interface, SDR Angel, GQRX, etc. It needed to be reliable, fail-safe and brick-free. That means if you encourage students to build custom firmware blobs, you need to make sure that you don't get uh, returns because they screwed up uh, the bootloader or anything else. It needs to be high performance and fast. I, I talk about this a little bit later on. Intuitive, ease of use, supportable, extensible, flexible, and of course, cross-platform so that people can use it on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS, for example. What's inside? The Pluto SDR uses a Zinc 7000 FPGA from Xilinx that is basically an FPGA plus ARM Cortex A9. It has uh, 512 megabyte of DDR free memory, 32 megabytes of spy nor flash, uh, USB LP5, um, and of course the AD9363 RF transceiver from analog devices. Um, it can capture uh, RF data up to 61.44 mega sample, and it has an LO tuning range from 325 to 3.8 gigahertz, uh, or with unknown specs uh, between 70 megahertz and 6 gigahertz. As you can see, there are two LEDs on the bottom, a tiny little uh, button, and uh, two USB jacks. One is connected to the on-the-go port and the other one is just meant to provide auxiliary power in case a USB host function is connected to the on-the-go on port. In addition, there are some spare pins that are connected to the FPGA fabric that can be used for um, designing custom custom logic or uh, to integrate it somehow into, into your use case. There is a JTAG port, uh, UART pins for for the console. Uh, there are some other spare pins over here that are connected to the transceiver. And of course, there's an RX and a TX antenna port. The Pluto SDR runs Linux inside and uses the Linux industrial I.O. framework to expose IQ data and control. It <coughs> appears as a multifunction USB device um, to, to the host if you plug it into a PC uh, with native I.O. over USB using FunctionFS. Uh, there's a serial over USB using the CTC ACM uh, layer. Um, it has an RNDIS uh, Ethernet uh, function, a mass storage drive, and it also supports device firmware upgrade. <coughs> 
uh, if you use it as a as a host, there are uh, a range of uh, device drivers built in to the firmware for Ethernet, Wi-Fi, or your human interface device and mass storage. It is cross-platform so that it can connect it to a Windows, Linux, or Mac PC. Uh, like I said, it uses the I.O. framework and also the lib.io. Uh, the concept of lib.io can be seen uh, over here. There are basically on the bottom I.O. devices, and then there is the library running on top of it. It communicates through the local backend with the Linux kernel and provides a high-level API to the user or to client applications that run on top of Linux. In addition, there is an IO daemon, uh, a server that also runs on the Pluto, that provides exactly the same interface over uh, a network or a USB link to a remote library running on a different computer. Uh, this is completely transparent to the user, so the client application running over here doesn't really know whether it's uh, talking directly to the hardware or uh, through a uh, network or USB link. On this slide, you see a top level block diagram of the system, simplified, of course. On the very bottom, you see the 809361 RF transceiver, which is connected via uh, some SPI interface, some GPIOs for control, and high-speed CMOS uh, interface with the FPGA. Inside the FPGA, we have several HDL cores. Uh, there are some hard macro cores for SPI and GPIO, but very important here is the AXI 809361 transport layer core. Um, the transport layer core connects via DMA to the Linux system. On top of Linux, we have split uh, the management of the transceiver into three different drivers. One is called the 809361-PHY. Uh, the purpose of this driver is to configure the, the transceiver, to set up the LO frequencies, to do all the calibrations, basically everything you control over SPI and GPIOs. Um, then we have two other driver, um, one for each direction, one for RX, one for TX, and that's basically the, the, the capture, capture drivers that manage the, the high-speed uh, data transfer to and from the device. All in common are uh, that those drivers are IAO uh, drivers. And um, important to mention are the different other subsystems. They, these drivers register with the clock subsystem, for example. Uh, that allows, for example, the, the RX transport layer driver to know its sampling frequency and, and so forth. So I talked about I.O. So what is I.O.? It's the Linux kernel industrial input output subsystem. And it's really not just for industrial I.O. It's basically for all non-human interface I.O. This can be ADCs, DACs, accelerometers, gyros, magnetometers, humidity sensors, pressure, rotation, and so forth. It's in the upstream Linux kernel for more than 10 years now. Why do we use I.O. for software-defined radio? Uh, it has a lot of advantages. It provides uh, a very good hardware abstraction layer, which allows sharing of infrastructure. It allows the developer to focus on, on the solution and enables application reuse. Also, kernel mode drivers have very low latency access uh, to memory, direct memory access, interrupts, memory mapped I.O., and so forth. So all that being said, um, I.O. provides a fast and very efficient uh, data transport from the device to the application, from the application to the device, and also from device to network or storage. So why is fast and efficient data transport uh, a SDR requirement? So think about uh, the Nyquist theorem. Uh, 
uh, that sampling uh, of 20 megahertz of real RF bandwidth, for example, that's exactly 88 to 108 megahertz for FM radio, produces a constant data stream of 80 megabytes per second at 16-bit samples. The Pluto STR maximum sampling rate is 61.44 mega samples, and that would uh, require a memory bandwidth of up to 245 megabytes per se second. And this is way too fast for any uh, USB 2.0. So first of all, it's very important that uh, we have very efficient low latency zero copy data transfers. IO supports two types of uh, interfaces. A low speed interface typically used with a low speed converters connected via SPI or I2C and a high speed DMA mastered interface typically used with memory mapped uh, devices. So this being said, DMA is used to copy the data from uh, to the device or to memory. Uh, on the application side, uh, the user uses MemMap to make those data available in the application. Uh, all this is zero copy um, and allows low overhead high-speed data captures. Uh, data is grouped into chunks, which are called DMA blocks, and the kernel driver manages just the, the ownership of those blocks. So either the application or the hardware owns the blocks uh, the samples per blocks are configurable and also the number of blocks in the queue are configurable as, as well. So this allows uh, to mitigate the typical producer-consumer problem and to bridge some gaps if the user application requires some extra time during uh, one block to process. When connecting such a device to a computer, user doesn't want to wait a minute until the device is booted and is available. So fast boot uh, was a, a, a concern for us. So there are many uh, good recipes and of course there's no one's, uh, no one's size fits all, um, but in general uh, less is typically more. So what we did, we slimmed down the kernel size by removing unnecessary kernel options. In addition, we slimmed down the root file system size. And a good way to do this is to use lightweight things. For example, BusyBox, a multi-call binary that includes all the typical uh, commands, shell commands uh, in, in single binary. Then we use a very lightweight uh, init system um, just with etc init tab and uh, some etc init d uh, sh shell scripts. Um, a very lightweight MDEF implementation. The other thing that significantly reduced boot time uh, was to use a silent boot. Uh, in the kernel, you can specify this uh, on the kernel command line with quiet and lock level equals four uh, or even below. Uh, and in U-boot, you just uh, set standard out to null def that uh, prevents any 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 writes to delay uh, the boot. Uh, in addition, we used a, a initial RAM disk, which is also uh, pretty fast once it is inflated into, into memory. And last but not least, uh, the typical thing, you want to set the boot delay in U-boot to zero. Uh, with all these measures, we got down to uh, less than three seconds. And uh, I think we just spent like one second booting Linux and the other two seconds we spent in the first stage bootloader and in U-boot to uh, uh, checking the fit image and inflating it into memory. So if you deal with a embedded Linux device um, and the user treats it like hot block removal that they just pull out the, the USB uh, cable out of it. Um, you wanna uh, you wanna avoid uh, file system corruptions, <coughs> and uh, we we are doing this by actually just using a RAMFS, and on the other side we restrict the flash memory write access 
to really the bare minimum. So we allow it during uh, firmware upgrades and uh, during eWood environmental uh, uh, manipulations and storage. Uh, for example, we, we save a few things in, in the eWood environment, just as like the, the host name or, or the IP address. Um, in the last firmware release, we have enabled a auxiliary uh, partition that, that we had in there. We have reserved one megabyte. Uh, it was called the partition QSPY, uh, um, and non-volatile memory file system. Um, and we used the JFS2 um, file system on, on that. And we use this to store persistent SSH keys or, or password changes and, and nothing else. Um, in addition, um, as I said before, uh, we need to prevent the user from accidentally uh, deleting our fail-safe uh, mechanism, our bootloader. Uh, and therefore, we use a flash block protection on the, the first megabyte of the SpyNor flash. Then we have uh, several fail-safe mechanisms. Uh, for example, one is if um, if loading the the the, UA, the fit image fails, we automatically enter DFU mode. Um, then there can be still the case where the user by accident uh, erases or the the UBoot environment or um, more problematic here is to just delete an important variable, maybe something that's related to booting from SpyFlash. Um, we need a, a recovery mechanism for that as well. Uh, like I said, on JFS2, we, we just have things uh, that are not really important, and if they are lost, they, they can be replaced. Um, but we have an additional MD5 uh, checking mechanism on all the files that that we actually put there. So before we before we copy the SSH keys from the JFFS2 partition back into the into the RAM disk, we check the MD5 sums, and if they are not okay, we we just don't copy those files. I mentioned the flash block protection feature. Uh, often it's called uh, flash locking. Uh, it is a feature of the of the flash in in in, in question. Um, we use uh, spy nor flashes, and, and those devices often have, depending on the vendor, either a top or bottom protect, and depending on on the boot mode of your uh, of your SOC, uh, you basically require a bottom bottom protect because it starts. Uh, executing or pulling data from uh, from block zero at, at s address offset zero. Uh, like I said, it is really vendor specific, and the block protection bits are non-volatile control bits. That means if you power cycle the board, they are still being set. In the kernel, um, the the drivers MTD spy nor preserves those bits, uh, so it it's not messing with these bits. Um, uh, where do we set those? If the kernel driver doesn't doesn't handle those, uh, we we kind of set them in in UWood during factory programming, and there are ways uh, to actually clear this uh, if you have access to the the UWood root console. Uh, on the right, we, we see like this bottom and top protect. It's basically you, you can uh, protect the number of of blocks and. Uh, starting at block zero, it's 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 with one megabyte and and and. The next block is two megabytes, four, and and so forth. Uh, so, during our um, development, we we actually found the need uh, to instruct the bootloader from from the kernel to do something different. For example, uh, let's enter DFU mode on on the next reboot. Uh, without pressing a button on, on the device, or uh, to enter a special DFU mode, uh, we call it a DFU RAM mode, and that is a really, really fast way to to load a uh, a new firmware without without flashing it. It just uh, writes it to memory. It's very, very fast. Or to just halt in U-boot uh, 
uh, so that you don't need to uh, press Control C while system boots, and, and hopefully you you can bypass the, the, the boot delay check and uh, get to a prompt, or just to start the system uh, with messages printed to the console uh, so that you see what what might be going wrong, because the default boot is silent. Uh, normally, you would use uh, FV set in V, that's kind of a UBoot tools command that allows to manipulate or read and write the UBoot environment from your uh, from your Linux kernel. Um, but like I said, we want to restrict uh, UBoot all kind of flash access, write access uh, to the bare minimum. So we uh, we take a detour here uh, instead of using the environment as 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 as, as the messaging um, variable. Uh, we use a general purpose read while field in the system level control register that um, preserves um, uh, through all the different types of resets uh, except power on reset. That's power on means really uh, take the power away and uh, reapply it. Um, but it, it's still there if uh, if it, the reset is caused by uh, a software reset or watchdog reset or, or something else and also this bit uh, or bit field that must not be uh, modified by the boot ROM or or the hardware so uh, we have created this tiny little uh, sh shell command that just takes an extra argument for example ram sf reset uh, or break and writes uh, the the code to a sysfs file which uh, is situated close to the the SOC reset uh, software reset, and it kind of puts puts it into the register. And uh, in UBoot, uh, we just pull that value back from that register and um, um, do the appropriate uh, action. For example, if uh, this register uh, has a free in 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 the lower lower uh, nibble, uh, we execute uh, the view mode for, for flash, or if, if it's a 7, we do the, the, the verbose boot, and so and so forth. U-boot uh, is in general pretty good. Um, if the U-boot the environment is corrupted, then it just switches automatically to the default environment. And the default environment is kind of a, uh, a compile time environment, um, typically uh, defined in uh, with a set of strings uh, in UBoot. And uh, so if the CRC doesn't match, it, it automatically uses that. But what happens if the user has uh, deleted a essential variable and that's causing uh, UBoot not to boot? Therefore, we kind of have the fail-safe mechanism. So that's some of the early init code uh, uh, in, in U-Boot. This is where it hooks in. Uh, if uh, the, the button is pressed um, during boot, uh, we instruct U-Boot to also use the default environment. And this default environment has all the, 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 the U-Boot scripting that uh, allows to it to enter. Uh, view mode again to flash uh, a new firmware or a, a new environment. So the control and interaction concept is pretty interesting. So the question is how to control, configure, or interact with a black box device that only has a hidden button, uh, two LEDs, and uh, a USB on the go check. So many things. We have Avahi, uh, ZeroConf, we also have a web server running on there. Uh, those are typically the, the recipes that you know from your uh, DSL home router or Wi-Fi router. Um, there's also some LEDs for uh, sign of life or state indication that we use. Uh, there's a, a serial console and also SSH, but that's typically just for the expert users. Uh, you could you could do more with the button, maybe Morse code. Uh, it's probably a bad idea, or to implement uh, a special USB function uh, and create a GUI for it. But that also is a pretty bad idea. So well, what else? 
and let me show a short video on on how we interact with this device. In this video, I want to demonstrate the use of the mass storage drive on the Pluto SDR. As soon as you plug your Pluto into your USB port, it will appear as a USB hard drive on your PC. If you open that uh, drive, you will see basically three files. Uh, one is the, the main landing page. It's an HTML page that gives you an overview of what this is all about, how to get started, where to download drivers and, uh, and software. Uh, it also links in a few third-party uh, support uh, applications. Uh, it has a firmware section, how it actually works. There's some embedded JavaScript that contacts the GitHub API, checks for the latest version, compares the current version of your firmware with the latest version, and then allows you to download um, a new firmware. You just download it to the mass storage drive, eject the drive, and it will automatically flash. Besides that, there's also some version information, uh, your serial number, what kind of version of Linux it runs on, what version of lib.io, what compiler has been used to build the firmware, and there's also a link to the sysroot, basically, the build root sysroot. Uh, it allows you to externally build compile applications. Uh, you link it against the, the sysroot and you just copy it over to your target. The password, uh, some information about the IP address and a few other things. Last but not least, there's also a link on how to get help and support. The other file is basically the legal information of the device, uh, the written offer, uh, what kind of software it uses, what versions and what license are those packages. Uh, the most interesting part is this config file. It is an any style uh, file that allows you to customize certain settings of your Pluto. This is in particular important if you want to connect multiple Bluetooths to your PC at the same time, so you can assign them uh, a individual uh, host name, give them a, a, a other IP address, and there are also some actions in here. For example, you can generate a diagnostic report. So what you do is just set this to one, save the file, close it, and then you it, it checked your master drive. It immediately comes back and has the desired information. For example, this diagnostic report, open it, it includes all kind of version information, the kernel startup messages, uh, a lot of information that's useful, debug, IO info, uh, the U-Boot environment, uh, the processes that are running on, and so forth. All that can be useful for debugging. As we have just seen, uh, the USB mass storage gadget allows your device to act like a USB mass storage device, just, just like a pen drive or a hard disk. Uh, what's required for this? It requires a, a backing storage. It's basically a, a, a block device, or in our case, it's a, it's a regular file. Uh, this regular file uh, needs to be full sized. So you kind of create it with DD, then you create a partition table within that file, and uh, then you also create a, a file system in, in, in that. Um, for cross-platform um, support, we decided that this um, file system need to be FAT. That's really a, a very common thing because it, it is cross-platform. Um, but the problem with this, and you, you might have noticed uh, our detour using the eject button is that this file can't be accessed, loop mounted, etc., while it's being attached to the mass storage gadget, unless it's read only from both sides, which uh, would be totally pointless. So how does it work? We timeshare the backing storage, in this case, fat.emg, between the USB mass storage gadget and the Pluto. In order to assign the, the storage 
uh, to the my storage gadget, you basically write its file name into a config.fs variable uh, over here. Uh, USB gadget, composite uh, gadget, blah, 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 uh, loon file. Um, in order to return ownership, the user on the remote side needs uh, to eject the, the drive. And this is done by some SCSI eject command that is typically present on, on all operating systems. It is uh, very similar to uh, ejecting a, a, a CD-ROM out of a CD-ROM drive. Once uh, the backing storage is, is idle, not owned by the mass storage gadget, we, uh, we have a kind of a, a daemon or shell script running on the Pluto, which a loop mounts this uh, backing storage and checks its contents for, uh, let's say, a, a new firmware or for some manipulations on on the config on the config file. Uh, we kind of do the appropriate actions, flash the new firmware, and once we are done, we uh, assign the backing storage back to the mass storage drive. So while we are flashing, uh, we need to give the user some, some indication that something is happening on the system so that uh, it, the user doesn't turn off power or pulls out the, the USB plug. And we do that by using uh, LED triggers. So in Linux kernel, there is a, a LED subsystem. Uh, it's called like the LED glass. Uh, what basically does is allows uh, the users to control uh, LEDs from, from user space. LEDs are uh, controlled via files in SysFS under Sys class LEDs. LEDs uh, have a brightness attribute uh, which sets the, the brightness of the LED between zero and uh, max brightness. For LEDs that are controlled by uh, GPIOs, every value greater than zero uh, will turn the LED on. But inter more interesting here is the concept of uh, LED triggers, and triggers are kernel-based sources of LED events. Uh, so during normal operation, we use the heartbeat uh, LED trigger, and that is kind of a, a nice flashing LED, and it, it, it looks uh, similar to like a, a, a heartbeat. And if the system load goes up, um, it, 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 it beats uh, faster, so you, you know what's going on, on on the system. But while we are flashing, we, we want to wanna get a, a, a better indicator. Uh, and therefore, we use the the LED trigger uh, timer, and we kind of uh, let the LED flash really rapidly, so that the user knows, oh yeah, uh, something is still going on. I better don't turn off power. In order to use those, uh, on the right we see a, a device tree snippet. Uh, you set compatible. Uh, GPIO LEDs, and then you, under this node, you can define uh, a number of LEDs. Uh, LEDs have labels. Um, they, uh, they are, uh, they have a, a P handle for the the GPIO that that they control, and of course, um, uh, they can also have a default trigger. In this case, it's it's a heartbeat. So when the system starts, it automatically enters or uses this heartbeat uh, f flashing thing. Uh, from the user perspective, um, it's SysFS stuff. You, you write strings and values into SysFS attributes. And these are the two sh shell functions that we use uh, for flash indication on and off. GPIO keys. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we have this kind of this fail-safe mechanism where the user can press the button while it's being on, and that um, lets the uh, bootloader enter uh, like a DFU mode. Um, we we also have something similar in in the Linux kernel. Um, 
and therefore we have this uh, GPIO con uh, connected to the GPIO keys uh, driver uh, and the GPIO keys driver translates GPIO interrupts into Linux input events. So these are Linux subsystem input events. And on, um, on the Pluto system, um, we use a input event daemon that also is part of BusyBox to invoke certain commands based on, uh, on these uh, input events. Uh, here it's very similar. Uh, you, you have a, a device tree a node with compatible GPIO keys, and then you have a, a number of, of, of nodes for the different uh, buttons in your system. Again, also a GPIO handle and uh, uh, some sensitivity and what kind of uh, input event uh, code or Linux code should should be sent to the input subsystem when this button is, is pressed or not. In this case, we use button misc. Um, on on the Pluto system in in basically user space, we have this uh, input event daemon running, and uh, this is kind of the the configuration file for it. Uh, it has a um, has two sections. One is global. And listen, it it should listen on def input event zero, and uh, the, the button keys that uh, it, it it should do something with. And in, in case like the button zero uh, event comes, it it, uh, it sets action uh, to remove all and then calls this slip mdef auto mounter script uh, that I will talk uh, a little bit about in, 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 in a, on a later slide. Here some some tips and tricks about multifunction USB gadget via configfs. Um, this is this is kind of something that uh, has cost me quite some some headages. Um, in general, USB gadgets uh, are seen as a set of configurations. Uh, each configuration has a number of uh, interfaces, also referred as uh, uh, as functions. Um, so sometimes the order of those interfaces really matters. Uh, for example, Windows uh, requires that and this is always on interface zero. If it's not on interface zero, really strange things happens and it, it all doesn't make any sense. Uh, this being said, it's just some, some heads up if you compose your own uh, multifunction USB gadget. Some other tips and tricks around uh, gadgets uh, are here. Um, in order to distinguish between different devices, the serial number stored in the device descriptor must be unique. So you think about you have you have multiple uh, of the pl Pluto's connected to your computer, and you want to distinguish between them, or or have uh, always COM port zero attached to the same device, even if you if you plug it into a different port. If you don't have a unique serial number, you you will get uh, 145 and next time you plug it in you get COM port 146 uh, that all is uh, not not really nice therefore uh, get get a unique serial number and um, this is where the problem begins um, assigning a unique persistent um, serial number is kind of expensive so uh, if you you would need to add some additional EEPROM, you need to uh, that adds, adds cost to the bomb. Uh, you would need to program that, and uh, you would also need to to have, make sure that you don't program the serial uh, the same serial number twice. This is all kind of infrastructure. So we we looked around and 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 actually found that the spy nor flash has uh, a unique ID code. And that unique ID code um, is right behind the JEDEC uh, manufacturer and device identification. And uh, it's not present on all SPI uh, nor flashes, but uh, Micron has it. Uh, and this is really useful. It's a, it's a 16-bit uh, unique ID. Um, and what we do 
is that we kind of just read uh, read this and print it to the kernel kernel console or the kernel message uh, when the system boots. So um, when we when we create the USB gadget, we just parse uh, use grep on dmask, get this by a unique ID string, and uh, assign it to uh, gadget string uh, serial number, and that works pretty nicely. Pluto USB host functions. So uh, the the USB port is an on-the-go port, so you can you can plug it into your PC, but you can also plug in uh, things that you typically plug into your PC, for example, memory uh, memory sticks, uh, Ethernet adapters, sound cards, uh, human interface devices, and so and so forth. Um, the Pluto, uh, if you plug in a memory stick or a hard drive, it will auto mount all uh, mass storage drives uh, such as uh, thumb drives, and the supported file systems uh, are ext4, ms-dos, and vfat which is basically FAT16, FAT32. Um, how, how we do that? Um, there's a, a hot black mechanism in, in the Linux kernel, and you kind of uh, write the, the hot black handler into that proxys kernel hot black. Uh, in our case, it's, it's, it's mdef. Uh, mdef uh, uses a, a configuration um, ini file, and in the ini file, we kind of instructed if there is a new device appearing uh, called SDA, for example, zero, uh, um, execute lib mdef auto mounter shell script. This auto mounter shell script will, of course, mount uh, the, the, the file system. But besides mounting, it uh, will also look inside that file system for uh, for certain files with s s certain naming convention. For example, if there is a file called runme0.sh, it will execute this as a, a shell script. If it's just runme0, it will uh, run it as a binary file. Um, you can have multiple of those, and those are being executed uh, based, on, based on their index. So runme0 runs before runme1. Um, there's also another function that I just introduced with the GPIO keys um, uh, slide. This um, is about safely unmounting uh, this this volume. So if, if the user uh, hits hits the button, it will uh, unmount the this this volume, so you you don't corrupt the file system. So how can you use this? Uh, so we, we, we use this, for example, to uh, to upgrade firmware. Um, we, we just put the firmware on a, on, on a flash drive, plug it in, and the the uh, the runme will uh, will call the the update script. But a lot of people use this um, to to switch from from the build root root fs to let's say a full blown ARM hard flow Ubuntu root file system. And uh, you can do that by using uh, the busybox switch root command. And the switch root command is nothing else than a kind of a change root. So you change root into the new file system and execute the, the init process of that new uh, file system. Um, this, is, this is really handy and uh, uh, pretty powerful. So managing hardware revisions and boot configurations. Uh, th there are always hardware revisions, no matter wh what you do. Um, but how can we handle those transparent to the user? Uh, can there be a, a single firmware file who rules them all? Um, does the solution have image integrity protection, or can it be fail-safe? And, and yes, there there is such a thing, and it's called qimage.fit. It's uh, Let's explain a little bit. So fit images are flattened image trees. Uh, these are basically multi-component uh, images, um, and they support multiple configurations. Fit images also support uh, FDT over overlays, 
uh, hashing and signatures and they are also good uh, for verified boot but verified boot is, is not needed here because this Pluto is as open as possible. Um, uh, fit images use uh, a, a device tree uh, structure. On, on the right you, you basically see a part of our uh, U-boot uh, U-boot script that kind of loads loads the whole thing so we do bit boot M the, the, the fit image with uh, with an additional uh, configuration and then it starts booting it says standard out serial echo boot f uh, no if the boot fails it turns out it turns on uh, the serial again and says it failed to boot and it enters uh, uh, defu mode so let's look a little bit at the the, the pluto.its that's the, the source image uh, file for that fit image um, so fit image are structured like this there is a, a root node uh, over here then you have a kind of a description and, 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 and a magic and then you have a, an images node and inside that images node you basically list all all your different uh, uh, components um, here in this case we have three different device trees for three different uh, uh, firmware no hardware versions uh, ref a ref b and ref c um, there are all these th all these nodes have have additional uh, attributes here type uh, architecture whether things are compressed or not they can have hashes and and so forth so the, the other thing is kind of the the FPGA uh, bitstream that's that's kind of uh, the, the configuration for the FPGA so this one has has an hash uh, it's not compressed and then we have the the, the kernel uh, the Linux kernel uh, image um, and our our RAM disk it uh, kind of pulls this from rootfs cto.gz uh, and it uh, is gzip compressed and also has a md5 sum and besides the image uh, these are kind of kind of the 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 the, the inputs uh, we have these configurations over here this configuration node and in that configuration node uh, we have different configurations uh, config 0 config 1 for example config 0 says uh, we uh, use uh, kernel uh, kernel uh, from one ram disk one fpga one uh, pluto currently only uses uh, so all hardware versions of pluto use the same kernel the same ram disk and the same fpga the only what's different is is the device tree so ref a uses ftd1 which is this ref b uses ftd2 um, and uh, there are actually two, two more nodes here which, which are omitted on, on here. So um, how, how do, we, do we handle hardware revisions? And that uh, is kind of the poor man uh, way of doing it. Um, so each different hardware revision of Pluto has a, a, has a has a slightly different bomb um, so we we have a we have a, a voltage divider composed by these two registers and for each Pluto ref we kind of change r2 to be a different value this results into a uh, kind of a different voltage over here and when the system starts we uh, we read this ADC uh, in uboot uh, therefore, we have created this uboot command. We call it Pluto Hardware Ref. So we call Pluto Hardware Ref, and this is the function that it kind of does. It it samples the ADC, and then um, it, it it takes this value, and we have 100 millivolt increments, and uh, we we kind of check uh, whether this value is within a certain range, and then we uh, we kind of get to a an index then we use snprintf to print config at index and we save this into the environmental variable fit config so once we have executed this command uh, fit config is kind of set with 
config add uh, one for example for ref b and then we just uh, execute boot m command uh, fit load address config add uh, fit config and that's the whole magic works pretty well so we're getting to the end of this presentation um, a few people asked me whether is it working making open hardware open open system um, yes it is um, we have shipped uh, nearly 40,000 devices since uh, the release in 2017 um, we have many many users in education and academia but uh, there's another community which is like rapidly increasing and that's the ham radio amateur community which use the Pluto for satellite communication and, and all other uh, crazy things. Um, it has been widely adopted by the open source community and there are many, many, uh, many, many SDR uh, integrations into all the kind of different frameworks. Um, so the feedback that we get from, from the customer is, is very positive and it, it just works. Um, some other comments I recently got was uh, that it's very easy. Uh, this RN, this uh, Ethernet function is very easy to integrate it into a virtual machine. And of course, libio is very stable and, and cross-platform. Here are some, some links and good pointers. So if you want to learn more about the, uh, the analog devices university engagements, here are some two links. Uh, there's the wiki documentation about the Pluto uh, good pointers um, and of course the source code can be found on our github and I also like to list uh, free books on software defined radio um, if you're if you if you got interested this is very good reading so thanks for your attention and uh, let's open the the Q&A session <laughs>